um, weather balloons uh, for fun. And uh, so this is just some images from one of the weather balloon launches up a few years ago. It was also in sort of the early days of um, smartphones taking off. So our uh, payload and everything, we didn't use. I don't think we even yet used a phone. We may have used an Android, I think, just for like GPS tracking and nothing else. And then uh, we had you know, these two, you know, uh, cameras, handheld cameras. And now I look at this, and this is increasingly becoming outdated. But it was a lot of fun, and um, I hope I don't know. I hope maybe there will be future Space Bridge stuff at Noise Bridge, perhaps if anyone's interested. So to get into it, I wanted to start with an image, uh, one of my favorite images uh, from you know space, and it's this image here. Have any of you seen this? No one, oh, <laughs> you of course. But yeah, so this image I love because it's just nebulous and artistic and beautiful and it looks chaotic and it looks like something that's very far out in outer space. But what we are actually looking at here is our own home, our own galactic home. This is actually an image of the Milky Way. And I love this image so much because we haven't uh, been able to really see what our own galaxy looks like until very recently. This image was taken in 2008. Typically, when we think of what our own Milky Way galaxy looks like, we think it looks something like this, a fairly quaint spiral structure galaxy, uh, which it is. But, oh, and you can find me right there in case you didn't know. Um, but the reason why I really love these images is because it really shows us how we view kind of our own home. So in 1785, this is an example of uh, a map of the Milky Way galaxy that William Herschel and Carolyn Herschel put together. And this was based off of a bunch of uh, star observations. So uh, William Herschel made a lot of star observations and then mapped what he thought our own Milky Way galaxy looked like based off of that. And then if you can see that like tiny bold star in the center there, that's where he thought Earth was. Um, thankfully, we now know we are more in the suburbs of the Milky Way galaxy rather than in the center, because if we were in the center, we'd probably be dead, uh, because there's a lot of activity out there, um, and uh, well, it's just a very chaotic place to live. And so, uh, here's this image again that I just totally love. I think it's just a really new way of thinking about what our own galactic home looks like. And it was taken by one of my favorite spacecrafts, the Spitzer Space Telescope. And the Spitzer Space Telescope was able to get these incredible images because it uses infrared. And so it's able to peer past all the space dust and space gas that usually blocks our view of our own galaxy and be able to give us gorgeous images like these. So this is just another example from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And so is this one. And these are just, I don't know, to me, they're some of the most beautiful images of space that I've ever seen. And I think, you know, for me, I like them also because they really, you know, make us change how we think about ourselves and our place in the universe. But most of my work focuses on changing how we view space exploration. And the relationship that most of us have with space exploration is one of observation. We're usually watching government agencies and astronauts and Elon Musk <laughs> explore on behalf of us, but we ourselves aren't doing much exploring. And this relates to my own personal background. Uh, because a few years ago, I was I had just recently moved to San Francisco, and I uh, I went to art school. My degree is in graphic design. I had worked at an ad agency for a number of years. I didn't have any space or science leaning whatsoever. But I was watching this great documentary called When We Left Earth, and it's a great documentary about NASA during the early days and how they were trying to figure out how to send humans into space for the very first time. I think it's still available on iTunes if you want to check it out. And I found this documentary so incredibly inspiring that I decided on a whim to send someone at NASA an email saying that I was a huge fan of what they were doing. I was a fan for all of like two weeks at that point. <laughs> and if they ever needed someone like me, someone completely without science background, that I was here. I didn't really expect to hear back from that email, but serendipitously, I ended up getting a job at NASA from that email. And it completely changed my life and uh, had a profound impact on me. And so I wanted to share, uh, hopefully if the audio is working, a quick clip from this documentary that sort of better explains why I found it so inspiring. To beat the Soviets, NASA must launch a man into Earth orbit. Only rockets can go fast enough. We knew nothing about rocketry, we knew nothing about spacecraft, we knew nothing about orbits. That's not a lot of rocket. 
it's launched, I'd say that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of them fail. A lot of them came up off the pad and went the opposite direction. Some of them got halfway off the pad and blew up. Some of them got to 10,000 feet and turned the other way and blew up. The whole thing crumbled and blew up. It looked like an atomic bomb went off almost over our heads. We got a big kick out of watching the Mercury astronauts. It was great looking at their eyes. and we want to go back and talk to the engineers a little more before we go further. So that's what I love so much about this documentary. It actually always reminds me of this image here. Um, that you know, NASA was still trying to figure out space exploration. You heard them talking about how they didn't know anything about rocketry or orbits or spacecrafts. And so I was watching this and saying to myself, well, I don't know anything about space exploration and I want to work at NASA. That sounds amazing. And I got that chance, and it very much changed my perspective of people at NASA from being rocket scientists who knew everything perfectly before they did everything, to being space hackers, to being people who were figuring things out as they went along, and people were, who were hacking stuff together. And so um, it really changed me because of, you know, doing something changes how you see it. And I hope a lot of you here at Noise Bridge especially can relate to this, you know, actually doing things, so doing science and doing space exploration actively changes your relationship with it from something of observation to something of active participation and contribution. Um, and so I got to learn a lot of great things while I worked at NASA. Um, I got to learn about dark matter and robots and all these this fun stuff. Um, but one of the most important things that I ended up learning while I was at NASA was that I didn't need to be an astronaut in order to explore space. And even more importantly, I ended up learning that I didn't even need to work at NASA to explore space. And so I left. Uh, and uh, this is now 10 years ago. Uh, I created spacehack.org, which is a directory of ways for anyone to participate in space exploration with or without a formal science background. And so launching this website 10 years ago was you know, really interesting and it was definitely one of the first kind of going into this area uh, in regards to space exploration. And I think it's really, it's been a fascinating last 10 years because a lot of people now are saying, oh, well, there's more players you know, in space exploration other than NASA. You have SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. So everything is accessible, right? <laughs> it's like, so now most of my battles are not even about trying to convince people that space exploration is, can be accessible, but trying to, um, I guess, still wake people up to the fact that even though there are more players, that these players aren't really making space exploration that open to everyone, and that's where a lot of my fight is. Um, on spacehack.org, uh, one of my favorite projects that I feature that uh, is still around is Austrian Space Forum, uh, which is an international effort to try and generate enough research to help someone one day go to Mars. So they're not the ones who are going to send people to Mars, they're not going to say which country or which company is going to send anyone to Mars, but they know that whoever ends up going to Mars one day is going to need a lot of research to help them out. And so this is um, a nonprofit that gets people from all different disciplines together. So lawyers, writers, uh, technologists, designers, people from all different backgrounds uh, to try and help create enough research that could help people one day go to Mars. So here you can see they're actually uh, digging in an ice cave in Austria um, and uh, they're testing out different tools that might be helpful for people to one day find perhaps ancient microbes uh, in caves on Mars. They're also testing out spacesuits and a lot of fun stuff. And so you can actually volunteer with them. You don't have to be from Austria. You can be from any country around the world. Um, since creating Space Hack, I've had a lot of fun um, getting into space exploration from the viewpoint of someone who didn't have a background in this. So one of the things uh, that I did is a couple of years ago, I came out with a book called What's It Like in Space? And this was because I increasingly found myself in the weird position where I was getting to meet astronauts, which not a lot of people get the chance to, but I wanted to ask them all of the silly, weird questions uh, and like how awkward it is in space exploration. So I created this book for fun. Um, another uh, project that I created for fun um, on the robotic side of things is Space Probes, which is spaceprob.es. And this is a catalog of all the 
spacecrafts that are at the moon and beyond that are currently active, and we scrape uh, data from NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory from the Deep Space Network, which communicates to the majority of uh, space probes out there, and uh, we scrape it so that we can say how far away from Earth all of these space probes are, and then, uh, okay, yeah, and then uh, you can like find out um, information about each space probe that I handcrafted, and you know all the cool tools that these space probes use, and data that you can download from them. Um, but my my favorite project that I get to work on year round um, that I definitely want to invite all of you here to is Science Hack Day. And Science Hack Day is a weekend event that gets scientists, designers, developers, and people from all different backgrounds together in the same physical space to see what they can rapidly prototype with science in 24 consecutive hours. So the mission of Science Hack Day is just to get excited and make things with science. We don't give challenges. We leave it super open-ended. You can do whatever you want to do. Um, and, well, people make a lot of weird stuff, which I'll get into. And so Science Hack Day came about because of my frustration that there's a lot of science data and science stuff out there, but no one was really doing anything with it, and people weren't really playing with it. And I felt that a lot of a lot of this science stuff that was out there wasn't truly accessible. It wasn't until people built interfaces to it or did something interesting with it that really it got hundreds of thousands of people to interact with it. And so born out of that frustration was Science Hack Day. And so I leave the event in San Francisco. This is an, uh, I think this is from a couple of years ago in San Francisco, and also Science Hack Day uh, around the world. So um, Science Hack Day is a grassroots um, uh, event. It's not a uh, franchise. You don't have to ask my permission. People can organize a Science Hack Day in any city, wherever they want. I've open sourced the how-to instructions for how to do it. We are now in 29 countries. Um, and so I lead the event in San Francisco, but I also try and help people um, around the world create the event in their own cities. And so I wanted to share with all of you just some of the uh, fun things that have come out of Science Hack Day, or at least some of my personal favorites. Uh, this one is an example of a uh, typeface someone wanted to create in which all of the letters would have equal wind drag. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but <laughs> they wanted to. And so what you're actually looking at here is a makeshift wind tunnel, and someone uh, cut out uh, each individual letter and then uh, uh, measured the wind drag of each individual letter and then weighted each individual letter so that all the letters would have equal wind drag. So if you want a typeface in which all the letters have equal wind drag, it looks something like this. <laughs> I have no idea how this is useful, but this was, <laughs> this was a, a physicist who was playing around, around with typography. Um, and so that's the thing that I love about Science Hack Day is you have people, yeah, playing around with science, but equally you have scientists playing around with art and design and tech, and you know everyone's playing around with things that are new to them, which is fun. Um, this one is from uh, a few years ago, actually. This was one of the early ones. Uh, this was a lamp that would light up every time an asteroid passed near the Earth. So it was sort of like a near-death lamp. <laughs> and so NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory has a database of um, all of the asteroids that are going to come uh, near the Earth, near relatively speaking, um, out to several decades, if not 100 years from now. And so uh, we hooked um, up an Arduino up to that data set, and uh, the lamp would uh, light up and make a sound every time an asteroid passed near the Earth, which actually happens fairly often, safely. Uh, and so it was sort of a, a device you could freak out your coworkers with. <laughs> uh, another fun one was uh, the particle wind chime. And so this was um, a group of people who wanted to explore what if instead of getting you know visualizations of subatomic particle collisions, uh, let's see, yeah, so usually visualizations of particle uh, collisions look something like this. Um, what if instead of you know seeing this, what if we could hear what these subatomic particle collisions might sound like? And so uh, they uh, mapped subatomic particle collisions to sounds and created what they uh, called the particle wind chime which was fun um, and actually went on to be look in, looked into as sort of an augmented diagnostic tool for particle accelerator laboratories. So if you've been in a particle accelerator laboratory, awesome, you are already winning at life. If you have not, <laughs> they are uh, surrounded by screens, a lot of screens, all the time telling them how the particle accelerator is doing. And so this hack sort of explored, well, what if you could get used to how it sounds and how it usually sounds, and if something sounds a bit off, then you could sort of 
begin to figure out, you know, how to um, how to troubleshoot it. And so that's what this uh, this got looked into as. Um, another fun one was uh, interactive planetarium, where <laughs> Andrew Packers um, uh, took a Microsoft Connect 3D scanner and they put planetarium software into it. And so instead of having a planetarium where you sit back and relax and observe, which is nice, they wanted to say, well, what if you could make it interactive and you know get information about different stars and planets using your hands and feet? Um, and then it was kind of cool because you could get more of a sense of like the distance between certain planets and stars physically. Uh, and so this is an example of someone playing with it. This actually ended up becoming a temporary uh, exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, and it was a big hit with families, um, so it was cool. Another fun one uh, was Satellite Symphony, which if you Google, Google for it, it might still be up. I'm not sure. I haven't looked for, for a couple of months. But this was a hack where uh, you can type in any location anywhere around the Earth, um, and it'll tell you what satellites are currently overhead. And in addition to telling you what satellites are currently overhead, it will put them to music and sounds based on how far away they are and how fast they're moving. And this was fun because a lot of times, you know, right now is a perfect example. You can sort of hear the traffic outside. You can get a sense of like, is it busy? Is it quiet? Um, you have this ambient awareness of sort of how busy or, or not it is around your house, around your work, um, but you don't really have that sense for what's over your head at any given point. So that's why uh, Satellite Symphony, I thought, was a lot of fun. Uh, my favorite story uh, from Science Hack Day, though, is um, someone who created a device that would detect when he needed to shave um, a beard detector. I don't know why, uh, but as I said, we leave you know, Science Hack Day very open-ended, and people can work on whatever they want. Uh, and so what this uh, person did is they took a USB microscope, like you can see here, and then they got this really gross image of all the stubble on their face. <laughs> Hope you haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> um, and they wrote some basic code and used an open computer vision library. And as you can see, it's saying, you know, no beard found, no beard found. And then when it finds, you know, a stubble, it draws a line around it and it can tell him, you know, how long his stubble is and if he needs to shave. So this was definitely ridiculous, but <laughs> but fun. Um, and I, I wasn't quite sure what it had to do with science, but sitting in the audience and seeing this hack demoed was a particle physicist. And when the particle physicist saw this hack, he said to himself, wow, that's actually a genius way for how to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber, which sounds silly until you know what cosmic rays in a cloud chamber looks like, which is this. Um, and so actually following uh, Science Hack Day, this particle physicist ended up creating a multi-year student-led research program around detecting cosmic rays in a cloud chamber that was based on the original code and open computer vision library someone used to detect whether or not they needed to shave. Um, <laughs> And so this is what I love about you know hacking and, and science hack day is that it's really all about things sparks for future ideas and future collaborations and future cool stuff. Um, so some projects uh, that I haven't been involved in but I've come across that I love are um, a project uh, that sort of taps into this multidisciplinary nature where a group of people wanted to 3D scan supernovas, um, but you can't quite you know take a 3D scanner and hold it up to the sky and get a <laughs> 3D scan of a supernova that way. And you can't exactly shrink a supernova down and, and run it through an MRI machine and get a 3D scan of it that way. But in a sense, that's what this group kind of ended up doing. They used an open source piece of software called 3D Slicer that's usually used to create 3D fly-throughs of brain data. And they thought, well, what if instead of feeding it brain data, what if we fed it supernova data? So they fed it this uh, supernova remnant, uh, Cassiopeia A. And the result that they got was this. This was the very first uh, 3D fly-through of a supernova remnant that was ever created. And this was created through a project at Harvard called the Astronomical Medicine Project, which, as you can imagine, was getting people from the astronomy department to collaborate with people from the medicine department. And they looked into you know, uh, visualization tools and different ways of looking at data, and they shared them. And equally, as much as there were uh, things in, on the medicine side that really helped astronomy, uh, figure out new insights, uh, they were able to find some useful stuff for using astronomy tools towards the medicine department as well. Um, closer to home, uh, just down the road, uh, there is the uh, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, 
Um, so SLAC is a very long linear accelerator uh, that creates subatomic particle collisions. But with the Large Hadron Collider and a lot of other accelerator laboratories that have been popping up around the world, uh, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory increasingly was becoming outdated. They weren't able to be as awesome as all the other places. They weren't uh, able to uh, produce higher and higher energies that now uh, particle physics needs. So they were sort of faced with this problem of, you know, well, we need to decommission this lab because it's not really useful for particle physics as we know it anymore. Um, but it's a really massive, I forget how long it is, it's like a full mile plus um, uh, thing of infrastructure that's kind of beneath the highway down south. And they thought, well, we could decommission it, but then we have all this infrastructure and it's too expensive to demolish, so that's not ideal. Um, so what they ended up doing was essentially hacking this accelerator um, because uh, something that occurred um, a lot of times with particle physics is you have electrons in them. And when these electrons wiggle or kind of go out of place, they end up creating tiny, tiny, tiny little x-rays. And that was always seen as like an annoyance, like it got in the way of doing particle physics. But what they ended up discovering um, a little bit before this and then ended up actually implementing at Slack is that these tiny, tiny little x-rays are like tiny little cameras. And so they started thinking, well, what if this annoying thing can be actually harnessed to do cool stuff? And so what they're actually now doing at Slack is uh, looking at photosynthesis at the molecular level and producing movies of photosynthesis happening in real time. This is something that's never been able to be done before. We don't still understand exactly how photosynthesis works, but if we do understand how it works, we can do artificial photosynthesis and do a lot of things that are really useful for us. So what they do is they send these tiny little electrons and they wiggle them on purpose, and then they have them shoot through uh, tiny little particles and they end up witnessing photosynthesis in action on the molecular level, which is really cool. So, you know, I don't know <laughs> how you can get uh, necessarily, uh, you know, involved in doing this in your own backyard per se, but this is sort of like hacking that's taking place on a very large uh, level where you're getting biologists and particle physicists working together for the first time. Um, another project that I have the uh, great honor of working on is uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. So I left NASA several years ago, um, but I was asked to come back to advise them externally. And so NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, also known as NIAC, is the only program at NASA that funds the more sci-fi future out there ideas that could be transformative to future space missions, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line. So things that are maybe not possible yet today, but you can do credible research and work on them to figure out if they're viable. Um, so the cool thing about NIAC is that anyone can apply. So you can be a garage hacker, you can be someone already working at NASA who has a boss who's not listening to your ideas. You can be international so long as you work with someone in the US. Um, you can kind of be anyone and their applications open in August and all you need to apply is a three page white paper. So I created uh, NIACfellows.org which is sort of an abbreviated guide uh, for how to apply to NIAC if this is something that might be interesting to you. Um, and yeah, the, I think yeah, the solicitation opens in early August and then it closes I think mid-September. Um, but the sort of things that NIAC funds are things like the Comet Hitchhiker, which um, as a space geek, when I first heard about this, I wasn't quite sure what was interesting about it because we've already sent a spacecraft to a comet, not that we should have any fewer of them, but um, I wasn't quite sure what was interesting about this um, and futuristic, but this is a concept to send a spacecraft to a comet, have it harpoon into the comet, and then reel out in a really, really incredibly long tether, and then harvest the kinetic energy of that comet to then be able to explore the solar system twice as fast as any of our current space probes. So with the Comet Hitchhiker actually using you know, the kinetic energy, so not using any of the materials, but just using the kinetic energy of it, it would be able to uh, get to Pluto, I think in about five years time, as opposed to almost 10 years that it took New Horizons to get to Pluto. Another fun one was uh, this uh, hack, or not, I guess it's sort of a hack, it's like a project concept and sort of hacking because it's, it was using technology in a way that it wasn't necessarily intended to use. So the MIT Media Lab created a really cool camera 
that is able to see around corners. And so what this camera does is it shoots out photons. Those photons bounce around and then bounce back into the camera. And because the camera has a very precise clock in it, it can tell the time that all those photons bounce back into the camera, and then it can create a map of things that are around corners. So here is a, uh, the literal version of this. Um, you can see there's a mannequin behind the uh, corner that the camera can't directly see. And down in the lower right, that's the map that the camera was able to create of what was around the corner. This was really cool, um, but it didn't have any space ac application at all. So a group at MIT Media Lab created this, didn't think about space stuff, but another group came along and said, well, what if we took this sort of technology and strapped it to a spacecraft? Could we actually like get 3D maps of like lunar caves and Martian caves? Um, and that ended up getting funded. And so this is a perfect example of like, sometimes it's just about taking the tech that already exists in different places and saying, well, what if we applied it towards space? Uh, they also fund uh, just fun things like sending a submarine to Titan, the moon of Saturn, that has uh, lakes of methane and ethane, um, and it's a literal concept to just have a submarine spacecraft, which is fun. <laughs> um, they also uh, fund, you know, synthetic biology stuff. So uh, in space, you know, here on Earth, you have electronics. They end up, you know, wearing out over time, and you discard them. Uh, but you can't really do that in space. If you bring a lot of electronics with you in space and they end up dying, it's not really great to just be accumulating trash. And so uh, what a researcher did is actually uh, focus on uh, creating synthetic microbes that can eat uh, discarded electronics, so eat a lot of different metals, and then end up pooping out copper so that they can create new circuits and new electronics. Um, and so I love things like this because you know when you think about like how to create electronics that might last uh, over a long duration or be really good for use in space, you might think, well, we should get all of our insights from the electronics world, but uh, this actually comes from synthetic biology and you know just uh, engineering microbes to uh, be really hungry for electronics and, and want to have copper as waste products. Um, this is another fun one. This was a uh, thing where someone wanted to uh, get rovers to stay in continuous sunlight on the moon. So typically when you send a spacecraft to the moon or Mars or anywhere, they have to power down overnight. They're solar powered. Um, so someone took actually the data and the imagery of how the sun goes across the moon on a regular basis, and they did computer vision just to kind of create a route for that rover to stay in continuous sunlight. So you can see here it's kind of treating like shadows like lava, like you can't touch it. Um, and it's going around all these craters. And this means that the rover doesn't have to power down overnight. It can stay in continuous sunlight and do more science and be more efficient. And this is the stuff that I really like because to most of us here in San Francisco, computer vision is a really present day thing. It's really you know, ubiquitous at this point, uh, but it hasn't been applied to space exploration that much yet. And so when thinking about you know, building the future and these sci-fi things, a lot of times, I think people convince themselves that they just don't think that way, or they're not very future thinking, or that it's just way you know, advanced for them. Um, but a lot of times, it's just taking stuff that's present day and applying it in you know, unique and clever ways towards space exploration that can be really futuristic. So uh, you know, to me, science fiction has been really good about exploring the unknown. It's really good about prototyping you know, future possibilities. But I think this is something that hacking is now really good at and, and being provocative and sort of making future possibilities happen. Um, so I don't know if this will play, but this is a, a quote from, uh, from John Peel, a radio guy uh, in the UK, and I just really love it. I mean, I think at the heart of anything that's good, you know, there should be something, there should be a kernel, something that's indefinable. And I think if you can define it, it will claim to be then, uh, in a sense, you've missed the point. So, you know, to me, when I'm thinking about space exploration and science and, you know, all these things that we could be searching for, you know, exoplanets or extraterrestrial intelligence or any stuff like that, to me, it's really the search for experimentation that's really incredibly precious. And I think we found it through hacking. Thank you. questions, but also if I have blown your mind with space and you just want to go get a cup of coffee now, I also understand. So, any questions? 
SF? Are you going to be hosting any hackathons in SF this year or something else? Uh, that is a great question. So the next San Francisco one is October 27th and 28th. Uh, and so if you want an early invite to Science Hack Day, just send me an email. You can find my email on my website. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll make sure you all can get in. Uh, October 27th and 28th in San Francisco. And also, if you have any friends who are in any uh, cities or countries that you didn't see listed up there on the map, uh, you know, feel free to ping them and, and tell them about Science Hack Day, and I'm more than happy to help them uh, get their event uh, up and running. Any other questions? Hi. So, is this is this your full time work? And if so, I mean, how do you divide up your time? It seems like you have quite a few great projects going. I was just curious. Yeah. Uh, so I'm independent. Uh, all of these things are my full time gig, if you can call it that. But I very much puzzle piece uh, different uh, interesting projects throughout the year. So. Yeah, I work on NIAC and Science Hack Day. Um, I'm working on a second book. Um, also, uh, this year is kind of a big expedition year for me. So in August, I will be going on um, a deep sea expedition um, to look at a, a submarine volcano, which is not, does not mean a submarine uh, like the one you saw, but actually an under the uh, water volcano. Um, and then uh, hopefully later this year, I'm waiting on the final dates, but I will be going to Antarctica to uh, look at the life beneath the ice there and sort of better understand uh, extreme forms of life here on Earth so that we can understand how to find them uh, in outer space. Um, but yeah, so being independent and working on all this stuff, I feel, I feel like my life is a little bit kind of like Noise Bridge. It's a little over the place and it's a little, you know, by the, <laughs> uh, a little scrappy, um, but, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't change it. <laughs> Any other questions? Cool. So uh, you can find um, links to like everything that I've talked about today on uh, my website. And yeah, uh, please do send me an email and just say Science Hack Day, you know, let me in and I'll put you on the list so that you can get an early invite and just make awesome stuff with us because I think you all would make really great things. So thanks.